Hello everybody, some final notes on this Wiscom repair project. It's come out beautiful. Uh, since you last uh, saw an installment on this project, uh, there's been about 50 coats of oil, maybe a dozen or more sandings. Um, some further little work that I identified as I went along. You'll recall from a previous video that uh, one of the forearm holes, the Forstner bit, I'm actually pointing at the wrong side, uh, did the pocket didn't come out perfectly centered on the screw head and I thought about it and thought about it. It was a tiny thing. I mean the uh, the washer, a lock washer, which I don't think is really a good idea here, but if one wanted to use one it even fit. It was just off center a little bit. But it kept working in my head and I was thinking that uh, a thin little half moon of uh, fill would be less noticeable to the eye than the bolt head being off center in its hole and so I ended up going ahead and redoing it and how I did it is I waxed uh, the drill bit that made the bolt holes and ran it through both sides of the stock with the shank part of the, of the uh, drill bit sticking out uh, on the side I needed to fill and then I packed a, a bedding compound around it and let it cure pulled the drill bit out sanded that down I put it in the milling machine uh, center found the center with the center finder uh, and then cut the Forstner bit hole the, the screw pocket hole but uh, what I did different that I figured out last time when I did it and it's on the video is is I used some wood in the vise to help capture the forearm to keep it from moving around and so the second cut the hole came out absolutely perfect and there is just the thinnest sliver halfway around the circumference of fill that's visible from where it was cut off and uh, I don't think that's going to be noticeable at all and I think this is much better for having fixed that. Um, so I think this might be the fourth Wiscom I've repaired and they've all broken the same place. Um, in fact when I carved this gunstock originally it was because the original gunstock had broke. Um, and now this replacement's broke. And I just want to share with you Wiscom owners out there, you know, the thing to be careful of is the these very thin forearm pieces of wood, and they're not like a regular brake barrel gun where the fork stops way up here someplace. Uh, this goes all the way to the back. And then these two wimpy pieces of wood are solidly bolted to solid steel of the action. Um, and that leaves this as the stress riser and with such a heavy action I don't think it would take much of a wallop to just cause this to shatter right here so um, you know additionally this being um, well I was gonna say you know I, I really recommend carrying it in a case even in competition it's so always handled my guns frankly I'm still a little squeamish about this uh, waving muzzles around thing that uh, air gun field target does today carrying around in caddies but it's become a well accepted uh, method but I would say if you're going to carry it like that, throw a sheet over it. Uh, but I really recommend just carrying it in a uh, in a case. And then you open the sit. I sit down, open the case, take the gun out, make my shot preparations, and take the shots. Put it back in the case, close it up, carry it between lanes. Um, it's kind of old school maybe, but it's guaranteed to keep the gun safe. And, and where I almost interrupted myself a minute ago is additionally, this being a uh, feather crotch. Feather crotch provides, uh, you know, it's an insane beauty. They're very expensive. I don't remember, I think this block of wood was like 1500 bucks or more just for the chunk of wood before carving. Um, but it does provide a challenge this very figured wood likes to get, I call them drying cracks, I think that's basically what they are, although the wood is sealed, it's not really going to dry anymore, but it's certainly an issue to let wood like this sit in the sun and get baking hot. I would definitely not recommend that, and this is a uh, word up, <laughs> Mr. Client, as kids used to say, it's probably old school now, um, I would not let this gun stock sit in the sun and get hot. Uh, because I allowed that and, and I can see and I remember when I first made this gun stock there were these drying cracks happening and I filled a bunch. I see where there's going to be a tendency for others but they haven't opened up. They're not actually cracks but I can, I can see where they could occur and then while working on it, I mean er every gun stock I work on I put it out in the sun and uh, help kick off the oil but that turned out not to be a good idea because it opened up a couple or three drying cracks. Now these are microscopic 
their, their hairline little fissures. And they're not like a crack going deep through the wood. They're just little openings of the surface of the wood, these little hairline cracks. But the thing is, they won't take oil. So uh, for those few, and they're invisible, I, um, I sanded it down and filled it with laminating resin and, and oiled it back up again, and they're not a problem. And in truth, any of you out there that has a feather crotch and my own Mr. Client, if you get a drying crack showing up like that, that's exactly what I recommend doing. It's just feather crotch just takes a little bit more effort on its maintenance maybe than a, than a plain straight grain piece of walnut, but it's not a big deal to uh, hit it with some 320 and get it good and well sanded but not down all the way to the wood by any means just you know get a pretty good sanding of 320 clean it with uh, well blow it off or you know paper towel works great to remove the dust uh, wipe it down with acetone mix uh, laminating resin up and rub it in with your finger all over in the areas where there might be cracks where there are cracks let it cure sand it off re-oil it up it's not a big deal at all it is a little bit of an extra maintenance thing that feather crotch demands of us, so just be aware of it. But you can certainly minimize that from happening by keeping it out of the direct sun. And I was a little foolish for doing that. I kind of forgot about the propensity of this wood to react that way, but it wasn't a big deal. I took care of it, but it, I think it's good that it happened because it reminded me about this, and I can now educate... Uh, you and the client to that fact. It isn't it gorgeous though. It's it's just beautiful, and this I really don't want any of you to think this is an issue, because the the alternatives don't have this kind of wood. <laughs> All right. So uh, mainly what I turned the camera on for is I wanted to show you how to install the action in the wood, um, and in a normal uh, Wiscombe stock. This would be very. Uh, this is kind of a, <coughs> a puckering, if you will, uh, operation because of this stress riser right here. You got these long thin pieces of wood and joined right here, and you got to spread it apart. We have to spread the stock apart because the in the middle of the action there's a wide section here. This is part of the gear assembly that uh, this rack and not pinion rack and well, I don't know gear. I should consider what the right language is for that, but. Uh, this rack assembly, is, this is the housing for it. So uh, that has to fit down in here because uh, there's a recess cut out for it that doesn't go all the way to the top of the forearm. So it has to be spread to get it down in there. So here's how I do it. I'm, I'm going to use one hand to do the spreading action like that while my left hand's holding on to the action and put it in there. I'm going to get the end of the action pretty close to the end of the stock, the end of the inletting just like that. I'm going to drop it down in there. It's a little bit of a snug fit around the uh, trigger block. Uh, it clears, but there might be just a little, see, it, it goes in and out, but it, you might find a little rough spot like I did where it's just a little bit hard to get it in. So now I've got it down to the forearm here, and I'm just going to spread the forearm parts apart and uh, put it in here. I, I kind of interrupted myself. I, I was saying that uh, you know a normal whiskum stock is a little bit of a pucker factor, uh, spreading them apart. But on this stock, we've got four large steel pins pinning across that area. So now we've got a, uh, you know, that stress riser is, is spread out over a wider area. And I totally don't feel, have any fear now about spreading this one apart. When I first made this, oh my goodness, I, every time I spread the forearms apart, it was scared but now I feel absolutely no fear I know it's really strong and yeah sure we've got a new stress riser at the end of where the pins are but uh, it seems like it's spread out over a wider area it's not concentrating it right there at the end where the stresses are highest um, you know let me just pop this back out again for a minute so I, I didn't hold this up now there, there's pictures on the website uh, with my uh, my DSLR with a long lens that show this up much better, but maybe we'll be able to see it on the video. Uh, this is the repair right here. I'm pointing at it. It is, uh, you know, really, you get the angle right out in the bright sunlight. You can see it if you're looking for it, but I would say for all intents and purposes, this is invisible. The other side, uh, the wood saw more force, more stress, 
and it's a and, and the gap is a little bit bigger and it is a little bit more visible right here it's right there not that figure up here I don't know if you can see it I'm just gonna move this around here a little bit and uh, oh that that help let me just see if I can find an angle I set a, uh, a LED shop light up over my shoulder to help show off the wood. Let's look at the other side again here. It's uh, right there. But basically, I think it's lost in all the other figure. I just don't think uh, anybody's going to notice it at all. Alright, one more time playing with the camera here. Alright, isn't that a gorgeous piece of wood? That's just beautiful. Alright, so I want to show uh, about the screws. So I'm going to put the action back in here. A little bit of fork arm spreading. Drops right down in there. Because uh, the glass bedding, it's uh, absolutely perfect, like machine fit like made for each other. Okay, I'm just pushing the action into the wood to make sure it's all the way back. I'm going to put the trigger guard in first and I've done several experiments here trying to identify the best assembly method. Uh, now if you got a long uh, Allen wrench for this screw that would be really nice to get up above the uh, pistol grip. I did not take the time to make or acquire one. So uh, this is just going to take a minute. And I'm going to put the camera on pause because i got to carefully and slowly turn this in. Okay, so I got the rear uh, trigger, well, there's only one trigger guard screw. Uh, got that in and snug, and actually I'd say it's probably pretty well torqued, but uh, only on the length of that very short lever arm, so it's not very torqued, uh, although it's probably sufficient. Anyway, it's snug. So next, I'm going to put the uh, rear forearm screws in because <clears throat> they're kind of the hardest. I don't know, they're all equally difficult. <clears throat> uh, it's the short screws go in the rear holes and the long screws go in the forearm holes. Now, this all started out glass bedded together absolutely perfect. How it could move around a few thou and make it difficult to get the screw into the holes, I have no idea. What is like a not quite dead thing. It's the undead. Anyway, um, look through the hole and see if you see a little bit of an edge of the threaded hole, then you know which way to try to angle the screw. I would encourage you, Mr. Client, not to open up these holes. You could if you want, but uh, right now they're drilled to the perfect fit for these screws and I like having the wood and the steel be absolutely perfectly solidly bolted together so the two can't move. Um, the idea of having the steel move in the wood, which would happen with um, rubber bushings or a loose fit of the steel in the wood, what that means is the steel is moving around but you're holding on to the wood to do the follow through with. And so you could be doing, you know, exercising the best follow-through skill in the world, but the steel is doing its own thing. So I like having the steel and the wood be an absolutely solid single unit, especially with a mild recoiling or non-recoiling uh, gun. There are uh, videos out there that show uh, in slow motion a spring gun. Uh, actually, I think it's an HW90 is the particular video I'm thinking of. And you see the action bouncing around in the wood. Uh, the barrel's waving around, and then the pellet comes out. So what kind of accuracy are you going to get with that? Okay, so here we go. I'm looking in there, and I see uh, just a few thou. I'm not sure it's even as much as half a dozen thou of the edge of a hole, of the threaded hole, off that direction. So I'm going to try to angle the screw a little bit this way. Now, we're not talking anything near enough to cross-thread. It's just trying to get that into the hole. Okay, see there? went in just no problem, but I had to give it a little thought to, but well, I'm going to leave this loose for now, uh, you know, which ang which way to get it. Okay, so now a long screw up here, now the end of these forearms are kind of flexible, and like I said, how could it uh, not be perfectly lined up after it was glass bedded perfectly? Who knows? But uh, see, so pull, 
pull the forearm tight to the steel and up a little bit to line up its hole and I see just a little bit faint hint of the threaded hole in that direction so I'm going to angle it a little bit this way and these could be a pain in the butt you know just take your time try to resist getting out the drill bit um, if you're going to be get, taking it in and out of the wood all the time, maybe you'd want to do that. You could even re-bed them a little bit to try to get them more perfect. I'm just blathering here. I'm just going to try to angle it over a little bit. Frankly, I think it's just because the wood is so highly figured. I just don't think it's uh, probably super stable. Oh, I got it. I got it. I just had to work for a, a minute. And just a note, uh, Mr. Client, what I noticed happened, and you might have heard it, camera might have picked it up but how I was holding it against the steel I don't think was absolutely a perfect fit because I kind of mushed it around a little bit and pressed it harder to the steel and I heard it go like click into place right where it wanted to be and then the screw went in no problem so just take your time be patient work with it don't cross thread the holes don't get upset it's a hobby all right here we go take this turn this over and do the same thing, a short screw in the back. Oh, I use a, uh, a small neodymium magnet. If, uh, you know, if I'm trying to try it and I can't get it in the hole and I need to get it back out of the hole so I can look and see which way I'm supposed to be angling, um, I just have a little neodymium to grab the screw and pull it out. But that was not a problem. It took a few tries and then I found it and it went in no hint, not the slightest hint of wanting to cross thread, it's just a little bit hard to, to find <clears throat> find the hole. Yeah, so here's one, i got to pull it back out and look because I'm moving the forearm this way and that way trying to find the hole. Alright, I'm going to hold it right there and it went in. So, I'm going to um, ship the action in, a, uh, in an action sock, a rifle sock. So, Mr. Client, you can pay me the extra 10 or 15 bucks that its value is. I just think it's a good idea to uh, uh, protect the steel as much as possible. So, I'm going to put the action in the bag, and then I'm going to wrap it in bubble wrap the um, wood, I'm going to wrap that in paper towel and then wrap that in bubble wrap. Then I'm going to tape those two bundles together and I'm going to uh, roll it up in a sheet of cardboard, but I'll probably fold it up in a sheet of cardboard rather than roll. Um, I've done it both ways and really you out there, you know, if you're shipping a gun, uh, I would say score the cardboard and try to make it be a box, but if it turns into a roll on its own, yeah, it's not a problem, and I don't really know which might be stronger, um, a round roll or a, or a rectangular square cross-section. So, let's see, is there anything else to tell? Oh, the, um, the butt pad, I had mentioned on a previous video that it was not a good fit uh, when it came to me. I don't know if that's because I didn't fit it. Maybe it was a different pad. Um, maybe the length of pull got trimmed so it didn't fit properly anymore. I don't know. Uh, seems surprising I would let it go out not being a perfect fit, but I don't remember its history. In any case, I took care of it. Um, I didn't want to put it on the 2 horsepower 80 grit. I don't think it's a full 2 horsepower. It's a pretty powerful uh, big belt sander that I usually use for shaping uh, butt pads and plates. Um, so I did it by hand <laughs> with a sanding block and uh, I did a pretty good job. I could have spent more time on it, but it is way, way, way better than it was. I uh, spent a little bit of time polishing the plastic. More time could be spent. There, there's plenty of work that could be done to polish the plastic, but I coat of oil on it and it brings out some black luster and I think it's just fine and it's uh, actually better than it was, so that's good. I'm going to send along um, a set of lock washers that fit these little screws and the pockets. They are just a standard um, number 10 split lock washer. Um, I'll go ahead and send along four of them in case you want to use them, but uh, I, I, I don't think it's a good idea for several reasons. Uh, one, 
you'll have to check the fit of the screws and make sure you still have full thread engagement especially the rear screws because the front ones they go through a threaded um, flange kind of thing and they got plenty of space they, they're not they don't run into anything so they can be a little bit long but these the threaded hole is just the thickness all you have is just the thickness of the sheet metal that's threaded it's very thin and then there's a mechanism on the other side so there's not a lot of room for play with the length on these so if you put a washer under it it's going to probably not engage the steel you have to fabricate another screw you're going to have to cut the pockets lower <coughs> frankly I don't even think I should send them along I, I just don't think it's the right thing to use I it would make the screw heads proud and I just don't think they're indicated a um, little drop of uh, I'm going to get the letters and numbers wrong but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about it's that orange uh, stuff S3J, oh I can't quite remember, I haven't used it in a while. Um, it's that orange stuff that uh, stops things from coming loose from vibration but it uh, doesn't set up hard like blue Loctite and it allows adjustability, it allows easy removal. I like that stuff except for the fact that you use that little tube once and you can very well kiss that tube goodbye because the whole stuff dries out pretty quick after that. Uh, or just regular, old, I think probably blue Loctite is probably the best thing just use blue Loctite. So you know what, I'm going to skip sending these. The regular number 10 washers if you really want some and uh, just right now I just don't think, they didn't have lock washers before I think just Loctite them in. Blue Loctite, things be just fine if it, if it even needs it. Um, okay so that's that. Oh I did want to mention down here um, about this uh, adjustable uh, harmonic tuning system the idea with this is, uh, as I mentioned that HW90 video in slow motion, you can see the barrel flying around before the pellet comes out and that barrel is vibrating at a frequency and so firearms, uh, the competition firearms forever, at least a long time ago, I don't know about today I've used a number of different kind of harmonic uh, tuning systems involving a weight on a rod kind of thing that you could, uh, you know, shoot the gun, see that it's okay, it's shooting one inch groups and then you adjust the weight one way or another well, that was worse and that was better and this is super good and you know tune it. Um, I've done the same thing with my competition field target guns weren't as fancy as Wiscom that has a you know built-in adjustable weight by using a muzzle weight and then removing weight machining weight up material off of it to change its weight and see if there's improvement and I've also very effectively done it by trimming barrel length is another way to accomplish the same thing. Ultimately, now this is a beautiful thing about Wiscom <coughs> is it comes with a system built in that's super easy to adjust uh, and ultimately this is something that really ought to be done fairly frequently because the harmonics are going to change with temperature, uh, air pressure, that's one thing I really found with spring guns that affect point of impact a lot and uh, <coughs> um, oh and pellet weight, uh, the age of the springs all, all these make a difference on the harmonics, especially pellet weight and and also especially um, the, string, the springs and the springs are going to continually slowly decrease in their ability or their performance as time goes on you know these are, I'm sure these are probably original springs and they're probably uh, some small fraction less of what they used to be and and every year they're going to continue to degrade a teeny tiny bit that you won't see much in performance but it can be enough to change the harmonics so I would say if you're lucky enough to have one of these if you've been afraid to adjust it um, Tom Gaylord has an article one of the few articles you can find online about shooting the Wiscom and and he said what he found and this has been my brief experience as well to, to make large large adjust and not on this gun I didn't shoot this gun um, make large adjustments and uh, see what happens and then when you see it's getting better make smaller adjustments one way or another way to find a sweet spot and it really shouldn't take very long you don't have to really uh, uh, go crazy about this and agonize over tiny bits it's such a super accurate gun to begin with but uh, I would say every um, month when you're doing your pre-match practice and checking your dope um, you know the dope always changes a little bit uh, based on time of year and, and temperature and you know other factors age of the spring the, maybe you decide to change pellet right all your numbers are going to change for sure if you change pellet and the same thing here with this uh, 
uh, harmonic adjustable system is uh, it should be checked, you know, shoot a group, adjust it a little bit, see if the group opens up or gets tighter. If it got tighter, bonus, right? But here's the thing I wanted to show you all is make sure you don't move that weight before you get started. This is the locking ring for it. So if you lock this screw against the shroud is the way it tightens. It tightens this way and tighten it against the shroud and hold it. <coughs> the, the end of the shroud here is just a cover. So, and it's screwing off of that adjustable weight. So to make sure you don't move that weight, and I didn't move this one, just hold this like this and, uh, and then you can take that off. And then uh, use a Sharpie pen to mark where it's at now, so you have some reference as you move it around. Um, <clears throat> and, and I rather suspect, like everything with harmonics, that there's probably a gross amount of movement that is allowed. But I guess what I mean is, you know, I bet it could be screwed way in, and, and maybe it takes like six or eight turns out, say, to get to a sweet spot. Then I bet you could go another six to eight turns out and find it gets worse and another six to eight turns and it gets better again. You know, I, I'm guessing it's going to be some kind of sine wave like that in terms of how it functions. So where I don't think it's too important about where it starts. Start it in the middle. If, you know, if the performance is lackluster, if you just got one of these guns and you're shooting a modern pellet and you don't know what it was sighted in for or balanced for, just... Uh, you know, make rather gross movements with it and watch what happens on paper. Okay, so yeah, I wanted to talk about that. The recoil pad. I'm going to skip the washers. That would be a mistake. And <clears throat> Carnova wax. That's what I used. Last coat. Meguiar's Carnova wax. Car wax. Uh, it's an awesome product. There's a lot. You know, I did look it up. I believe it does a lot for UV protection because of my experience using it with composites, uh, fiberglass, carbon fiber stuff. The difference is huge. Without it, the fiberglass turns brown and a couple times out in the sun. With it, it'll look good for years. But I did recently read up on the product and it doesn't actually have any UV additives in it. So I think Carnova Wax is just naturally UV protectant. But anyway, that, I got one coat on there. You might want to put more. If you look at the finish obliquely, you can see little imperfections. That's just the nature of being hand rubbed oil. All the pores of the wood are filled. It's absolutely filled everywhere. It's a mirror smooth finish everywhere. So that plastic finish that's now microscopically on top of the wood, you're really looking at the wood surface here because I sanded the oil down every time. But you know, there's a dozen coats probably or half a dozen coats microscopically thin above the wood. That's why a finish like this makes the figure pop so much. You're actually looking at the wood. You're not looking through a mile of finish before you get to the wood. So the light's reflecting directly off of the wood. It just really provides an amazing look. But if you get the light oblique to the finish, you'll be able to see kind of streakiness looks and you know, like, kind of like imperfections in the finish. It's not really, it's just a nature of the beast. You could go at it with rubbing compound and polishing compound and get it to look even better, but I think this is a perfect finish, and I would just go ahead and put it into service. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Sorry I rambled on a little bit long. I'm just super excited to have had an opportunity to help this guy out with this broken stock and, and have a chance to work on a Wiscom again. That's always a real pleasure. And, but I appreciate all you guys for watching and for giving me a thumbs up when you watch my videos. That really helps out my little channel. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, subscribe if you have a mind to. And if you want to be notified when I publish, hit that bell icon and you'll get an email, I think, is how it works. And uh, thanks, everybody. And hopefully in the next week I'll be back on some HWs. Bye now.